Good morning, everybody. Oh, it's good to be with you. Good to be with you this morning. I can't believe it's already the end of August. Where did the time go? What's happening? I don't know about you, but summer is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of summer, so when it comes to, when we get to the end of August, I'm a little sad. So enjoy it. Enjoy it while it lasts. Hold on to it desperately. The snow will be here before we know it. <sighs> Sorry, I'm going to bring the mood down. Let me give you a few announcements. Raise your spirits a little bit. Uh, in case you were wondering, some of those photos on the, on the screen, we uh, took a few photos from baptism at the lake last week, and I saw several faces there. Uh, what a celebration. 45 people were baptized or reaffirmed their faith, and that is awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So thanks for being a part of that, uh, for praying, for, for celebrating with those people. Uh, it was a blast. It was a blast. It always is. Um, in other news, coming down the pipeline, choir is this Tuesday, starting back up, 4.30 on Tuesday, right here in the sanctuary. Uh, and then... Not too far in the future, uh, the Zion Lutheran Church Women's Luncheon is going to be held Thursday, September 5th at noon, uh, so feel free to join us for that. Uh, and yeah, I think that might be everything that I, am I forgetting something? Am I forgetting a thing? I think that might be it. Thank you. Yeah, Lutheran World Relief, the kits in the back, if you are able to help with that, that would be Fantastic. Thank you. I knew I was forgetting something. I always forget something. There's always something. Well, anyways, let's stand. Let's greet one another. Let's worship together. In the name of the Father, 
and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us take a moment of silence for reflection and self-examination. Most merciful God, we confess that, that we are in bondage to sin, sin and cannot free ourselves. ourselves. We, we have, have sinned, sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We, we have not loved you with our whole heart. heart. We, we have not loved our neighbors, neighbors as ourselves. For the, the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, Christ have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace of above and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, your word feeds your people with life that is eternal. 
direct our choices and preserve us in your truth that renouncing what is false and evil, we may live in you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first lesson is from the 29th chapter of Isaiah, beginning with verse 11. For you this whole vision is nothing but words sealed in a scroll. And if you give the scroll to someone who can read and say, please read this, they will answer, I can't, it is sealed. Or if you give the scroll to someone who cannot read and say, please read this, they will answer, I don't know how to read. The Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that have been taught. Therefore, once more, I will astound these people with wonder upon wonder. The wisdom of the wise will perish and the intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. Woe to those who go to great depths to hide their plans from God, from the Lord. Who do they work in darkness and think, who sees us? Who will know? You turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall what is formed say to one who formed it, you did not make me? Can the pot say to the potter, you know nothing? In a very short time will not Lebanon be turned into a fertile field and the fertile field seem like a forest. In that day, the deaf will hear the words of the scroll and out of gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. Once more, the humble will rejoice in the Lord. The needy will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Today's responsive reading is from Psalm 14. Let us read it responsively by half verse. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind. See if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good. Not even one. Do all these evildoers know nothing? They devour my people as though eating bread. They never call on the Lord. But there they are, overwhelmed with dread. For God is present in the company of the righteous. You evildoers frustrate the plans of the poor. But the Lord is your refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. The Lord restores his people. The second lesson is from the fifth chapter of Ephesians, beginning with verse 22. Wives should submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they fed and cared for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, 
but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as you love himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Here ends the reading. The Holy Gospel, according to St. Luke, the seventh chapter. Glory to you, Lord. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet... He would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say amongst themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, good morning to you again, church. If you are new with us, visiting, joining online, my name is John Hoppel. I'm the traditional service director here at Zion, and I'm bringing God's word again this morning, and I love it. 
I got to tell you. They pay me to do this kind of stuff. Isn't that incredible? I love it. I love being here. I'm blessed to be here. And we're continuing our series. Really, we're winding down our series. We're coming to a close of the summer and our summer series, The Not-So-Secret Secrets, where we've been diving into many of the parables that Jesus taught to the crowds, to his disciples, to the people who would listen. Um, This one is a bit shorter. This one is a bit shorter uh, on the shorter side, but that doesn't make it any less important. Don't make the mistake of thinking this isn't an important teaching. Uh, In fact, I, I think it has the potential to change the way we think in a big way, both in how we view ourselves and how we view others in light of God's mercy. As we've journeyed through the parables of Jesus, we've heard how the kingdom of God is a precious thing, how it's different from all the other kingdoms of the world, how the king, God, is full of grace and mercy to all who would come to him. He wants all to come to him and to know him, and he wants to extend mercy to those most in need of it. He wants to extend mercy and grace to you and to me. But there's a question that I was wrestling with as I read through this parable. Just kind of popped into my head as I was reading it. Do you need God's mercy and grace? No, really. Do you need God's mercy and grace? And you say to me, well, that's obvious. I mean, the obvious answer to this question is yes, of course. What do you mean? Even those who don't know much about Christianity would say that Jesus came to the world to forgive sins. So that there must mean that there are sinners out there who need forgiveness. And of course, this is what we read in Scripture. Isaiah 53, 6 says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Romans 3, verses 10 through 12. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Yeah. There's a few people in need of forgiveness. So we need God's mercy, that much is clear, but I guess the question still stands. Do you need God's mercy? Or rather, do you recognize your need for it? This is where our gospel lesson for today comes in play, our parable, what Jesus teaches on. Jesus was invited by a Pharisee by the name of Simon to come over to his house, to dine with him. And we don't fully know what Simon wanted to get out of that meeting. Maybe Jesus was right on the rise of his popularity, and Simon thought, maybe I can, maybe I can pick his brain a little bit, see what makes him tick. Why do people like this guy so much? What does he preach? What does he teach? And maybe... Maybe I can use some of that. Or maybe it just seemed like the right thing to do. Jesus was passing through, and in the spirit of hospitality, Jesus, come on in. You're welcome at my place. Let's have dinner together. We don't know why. We don't know why exactly. But we do know, because Jesus points it out a little later in the passage, that he wasn't very hospitable. Sure, he might have invited him into his house, But that was kind of where the hospitality ended. And in those days, even today, we want to be hospitable. Hospitality is a value in our culture. It is. When you invite somebody over to your house, you want to be a gracious host. People like that. People enjoy that. But in those days, it was especially important. And there were things that you would do as a courtesy uh, to a guest that would come into your home, to take care of them, to honor them. And because the, the roads were so dirty, so filled with grime and muck, water was often provided to wash their feet, 
as they came in, but no water was provided. The greeting in those days was a kiss, but must not have been much of a greeting because that didn't happen either. And sometimes they would give anointing oil as another way to show their hospitality, to show value to the guests that was in their home. But Simon missed the mark on that one too. And those things not being hospitable, they were also kind of, kind of taboo. Those were things that you, you kind of did. You, you, it was just expected of you. you. You ought to provide those things. And Simon, for whatever reason, missed the mark on that one. But, <laughs> but throughout the dinner, someone else enters the picture enters the picture. A woman approaches Jesus as they're reclining at the table. And in those days, they, the, the table wouldn't have been something like we're familiar with, where we come and sit down in chairs around a, a dining room table. It would have been closer to the ground. So when it says that Jesus was reclining at the table, literally, he was reclining, lying down, feet away from the table. And in homes in those days, in some of those homes, there would have been private areas for family and friends to gather, but there also would have been an open courtyard, a public place where people would walk through. And it just so happened that this woman walked into their gathering and stood behind Jesus. And I can imagine that their conversation probably died in that moment. As more and more people notice this woman walking into the room, recognizing, oh, it's you. This woman was well known for her reputation. This woman was well known in the community. And I can imagine as she started to weep, the level of awkwardness just started rising. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that, where th the conversation takes a bit of an awkward turn. You don't know what to say next, or you're not really sure how to respond. I mean, can you imagine that scene? Can you feel the awkward, uncomfortable silence that must have smothered the room, broken only by the occasional sobs from this woman? the splashing of oil and the soft rustling of hair against skin? What would you be thinking? I wouldn't know what to make of the situation. I would be very uncomfortable, and if I'm honest, I might be thinking something like, Simon, is Jesus just going to allow this? What's happening right now? Doesn't doesn't he know who she is? <laughs> now, get this. I mentioned that this woman brought expensive perfume. And when I read that normally, I, I just read right through it. I just absorb that fact and carry on. Oh, okay, she had perfume. Yeah, that's, I guess that's a common thing for women to have. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's a common thing for a woman to have. Got it, moving on. Check that. But why does she have this? An alabaster jar of expensive perfume. Why does she have this? This didn't just appear from nowhere. She most likely bought that expensive perfume for her job, for her profession, what she did, what she was so well known for, for future business. And if you know some of Jesus' other encounters that he has with people, Wherever he, whenever he forgives someone's sin, he usually says, now go and sin no more. One of the more well-known passages is from John chapter 8, where we see Jesus combating the Pharisees who want to stone a woman caught in the act of adultery. John 8, verse 10 through 12, Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. 
Jesus offers forgiveness and mercy, and then follows it up with, go, leave your life of sin. Go and sin no more. But he doesn't say that in this passage. He doesn't say that in our, our story today. Why? Why doesn't Jesus say that? Because when this woman broke that jar, poured the oil, the perfume over Jesus' feet, that was her act of worship. She was leaving her sinful life behind. This expensive perfume was an offering of sorts, a casting off of who she was. And the most telling part, the most, frankly, the most inspirational thing about this woman is that ultimately she wasn't concerned with how it looked to others. See, (laughs) I don't know about you, but I am so easily fooled by looks, by appearances. I think a lot of us are. I think that's a lot of our culture today. We think that just because someone looks the part or has the right things or says the right things or does the right things, well, they must be doing something right. Their life must be going pretty well. Social media is full of all these carefully curated images that give the impression of wonderful, perfect lives. But what if you're someone who doesn't subscribe to the allure of social media? Maybe that's not you. I know everyone in here is a social media guru. I mean, you guys, you guys know it, right? You're on Instagram every single day. I know it. I know you guys. Even if you're not, you still have to be wary of keeping up appearances. Sure, you might see images on Instagram of a couple on vacation and think their life is perfect. Their marriage must be wonderful. You might meet people around you who, like the Pharisee, appear very well put together. They look well dressed. They're respected. They're successful. And you think, man, everything they do just works. <laughs> They don't seem to struggle at all. Or, and this is going to hit a little close to home for me, you might see a pastor who not only speaks a powerful, inspirational, moving sermon, but they sing liturgy with a beautiful angelic voice too, hypothetically. And if you do, you might be tempted to think, wow, He must be really spiritual. He must be really close to God. I could never have that kind of faith. See, Simon the Pharisee was concerned with his reputation and his status. And moreover, he was concerned with how the people around him behaved and how their actions might reflect on him. I think he wanted Jesus to call out this woman as a sinner so that he could call attention to how good he was by comparison. Jesus, don't you know who that is? Because we do. And if you really knew who she was, if you really were a prophet, there's no way that you would let her, within 500 miles of you, get her out of here. But this is where Jesus brings in his parable. And like I said before, it's short. It almost seems like a trick question. Jesus tells Simon there were two men who owed money. One owed 500 denarii, one owed 50. And a denarii was a day's wage. So a good amount of money. And neither of them had the money to pay, so the money lender forgave their debts. And Jesus looks at Simon and asks the question, which do you think will be more grateful. Which do you think will love the money lender more? It plays like a trick question. I imagine Simon standing like, uh, I, I mean, the one who had the greater debt. Yeah, you're right. It's not a trick question at all. Those who have been forgiven much love much. And those who have been forgiven little, love little. And here's the secret. 
we've all been forgiven much. We've all been forgiven much. James chapter 2, verse 5 reads like this. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has God not chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? God does that a lot, doesn't he? God chooses the underdog, the, the one you wouldn't think, no one would think, yeah, that's the guy I want as king. That's the guy I want running this country. Oh, that's, that's the woman I want teaching, preaching. That's the person who I would pick. Famously, David, King David in the Old Testament, was the youngest of many, many brothers. And one by one, Samuel the prophet went down the line asking God, is it him? Do you want him to be king, Lord? Nope, not him. Is it him? Is it him? Is it him? And he exhausted every single one of the sons. Every single one. He's like, well, okay. Lord, you brought me here, and I've gone through every single one of the sons, and you, they're not king. None of them are king. Hey, uh, Jesse, do you have any more sons? Well, I do have one more. He's out in the field watching the sheep. All right. A shepherd, sure. Call him in. Why not? And as soon as he gets there, God says, him. That's the one I choose. The shepherd? Really? Are you kidding me? Yeah. That's the one I choose. See, Simon the Pharisee, he missed out. He didn't display the hospitality most would expect in that day and age for whatever reason. Maybe he didn't really like Jesus that much. Maybe he forgot. Whatever the case, he loved little because he didn't see himself as having been forgiven of anything. The ironic thing is that the woman wasn't the only well-known person in that room. Simon was a well-known Pharisee. The woman was well-known, but Jesus was also well-known for his teaching, for his preaching. And ultimately, just because Simon was a Pharisee of reputation, just because everybody knew who he was, they didn't really know what was going on inside. But the woman did. The woman knew her faults. She knew what she had done was wrong. Everybody knew. And despite the stares, the condemnation, the potential danger, she sought forgiveness for the one who has the authority to forgive sins. And what she found was the truth that extends to every single one of us. You are deeply, deeply loved by God. Not only are your sins forgiven, not only have you received mercy, but you have been given grace, a love we don't deserve, a brand new life with Jesus as our Savior. We have been forgiven much, friends. And you are loved by the King. This is the good news of the gospel. You you are loved, you are the beloved. 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. If you're anything like me, you can forget how loved you are. And if you have forgotten just how loved you are, I encourage you to reflect on that. Read that. 1 Peter 2, verse 9 and 10. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. 
Reflect on it. Remember just, just how loved you are. Because when you know you are loved, then, <laughs> then things start to change. Like the woman who came to Jesus, despite all of the social faux pas, despite actual physical danger that could have been foisted upon her. She wanted to give back to Jesus. She wanted to leave what she had known for something better. Because we are loved, we are forgiven. And because we are forgiven, we can be bold and love like that woman did all those years ago. For many of you here, your relationship with Jesus is great. You're thinking, God is good, and I'm glad to be here, part of his church. I'm glad to be here on a Sunday morning. I look forward to it. And genuinely, that is a blessing. That is a wonderful place to be. But I want this parable to challenge us this, this morning, to help us examine our faith, our actions, and how we love. <laughs> Are there areas where we're keeping up appearances? Places where you can express gratitude on a deeper level, where, where do I need to show mercy? Or where do I need to receive mercy? There's a reason that we pause in our liturgy for a moment of silence, reflection, and self-examination. And it only lasts uh, 10 seconds, 15 if I'm feeling Feeling fun that morning? We need some extra time to reflect. But those moments of self-examination where we look inside ourselves and we go, am I wearing a mask? Am I keeping up appearances? Do I really, really know how loved I am? Because when you do, when you do, you can love others just as much as God has loved you. I think one of the greatest things that God does for us is redeeming us, inviting us into what he's doing, into a new life. And it's up to us to hop on board and follow where he's leading. This, today, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Be glad in it. Amen? Amen. Would you pray with me? Awesome God. Huh. Lord, sometimes it, it's, it's difficult not to compare ourselves to others for better or for worse, it's difficult not to look around and think, God, we've got things made. <laughs> it's difficult sometimes not to look around and think, they have something that I'm missing and I wish I had what they had. But God, you ask, you, you call us to look to you. Because with you, we are so, so loved. And with you, we have everything that we will ever need. God, remind us of your love in the coming days, weeks, and months. Remind us of your love. Help us to remember just what you have given to us. And help us to love like you have in big ways and in small ways. Help us to walk daily with you. We love you, Lord, because you first loved us. We praise you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. We'll now receive our tithes and offerings.
Let us confess our faith as we join in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O oh Lord, we pray for healing and strength for all those in our congregation. We ask that you give them rest and that your healing hand would be upon them. We pray for Dorothy Weir and Knox Tisdall who are hospitalized. We also pray for Dean Moffat and Nancy Gould who have been released from the hospital. Continue to restore them with your power, O God, and comfort all who still struggle with your presence. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we ask that you surround students with harmony and an eagerness to learn as they begin a new school year. We also pray for wisdom, grace, and strength for teachers and for them to be reminded that they are shaping the future as they teach their students. Lastly, we lift up John Hoppel, who not only cares for our traditional service, but now is also preparing to return to seminary classes. Light his path as he journeys through his theological education. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God of our salvation, it is your will that all people might come to you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Inspire our witness to him that all may know the power of his forgiveness and the hope of his resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we cannot name all for whom we wish to pray this day. Some are known only to one or two of us. Some are known only to you. Yet we wish to place them all under your loving care. So together we pray for all who are named silently this moment by any in our midst. Bless them, surround them with your love, and perfectly provide for each one. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer.
Well, as you go from this place, remember whose you are and who it is you represent. Receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen, amen, amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.